Hey everybody and welcome to our very first Psych 101 video. My name is Alex and I'm going to be uh, your professor for this semester. Thank you so much for being in this class. Um, I gotta say I am a little little excited about this class uh, because, sorry, I'm very excited about this class and the reason why is because I haven't taught Psych 101 in like three and a half years and I know that doesn't really sound like all that much but that's basically half the time I've been teaching um, that I haven't been doing Psych 101 and so I'm really really excited to kind of get back into this um, and uh, talk about kind of intro to psychology. One of the things that I really like about this class and um, what and I should stop here for a second uh, let that be a cliffhanger uh, this video is meant to kind of walk you through the course expectations uh, so what can you expect from this class what can you expect from me as your professor we'll talk about the different kind of grading breakdowns uh, in terms of what kind of assignments are going you can expect this semester and then we'll talk about what we're going to do on our first week of class here online um, but to get back into my train of thought um, one of the things that I really love about Psych 101 is that um, because not everybody loves teaching Psych 101. Sometimes, usually, professors that have been in, you know, been teaching for a while, they don't really like Psych 101 all that much. Um, the reason why I love it is because it feels like a greatest hits kind of album. If you remember those uh, when they still used to make greatest hits albums, uh, but basically the idea is like we're going to go through psychology and we're going to talk about some of the most important, most popular, most influential research designs and experiments and ideas and people and, and concepts uh, and kind of leave maybe all the boring stuff uh, for uh, for other classes. We're just going to talk about the cool stuff, basically. That's the way that I see it. Uh, so let's get into it. Before I give you a definition about what psychology is, because some of you, maybe you took this in high school. Maybe you already know what psychology was. I didn't. I didn't really know what I was getting into until Psych 101. Uh, so instead of giving you a definition, I want to show you maybe some of the different areas um, that we're going to be speaking to uh, this semester. So when we say what psychology is, what do we mean about that? So in order for me to answer that question, let me ask you another question. Which of these two smiles is real? Which of these two smiles is genuine? It's the same guy sitting in the same uh, office chair behind the, you know, in front of the same bookshelf with the same books on it, and yet one of, and yet these pictures are different because one of these is a genuine smile and one of them is a fake smile. Which one is it? The real smile is the one over here on the left, and some of you already know why. Um, if you don't know why, that's okay. Let's take a let's take a look at the other one. What about this? This image right here. Which one of these is the genuine real smile? take a second to look what is it that you see oftentimes people will get this right but they may not be able to articulate why they got it right so in this case the guy on the left is smiling and in this case the guy on the right is smiling this is the fake smile how do you know that though what is it that sticks out to you if you're judging just based on the bottom half of the face there's really not that big a difference right these are both smiles with teeth these are both smiles that don't have teeth. If we look at how much they are smiling, they're roughly the same in both cases. The, the shape of the smile is roughly the same, but what is different is the eyes. So if you look at the eyes over here, you see the little bit of a wrinkle uh, going on here. The eyes are smaller, uh, less defined wrinkles on this side of the face and the fake smile image. And the same is true over here. Here for the fake smile, we don't really see all that many uh, with that the eyes aren't really smiling, so to say, uh, and, and they are here. Uh, so what does that mean? Does that mean that you have more wrinkles on your face, that you're happier, that you have real smiles? No, but it does mean that when we are smiling, we're not just smiling with our mouth that there's more that goes into a genuine smile that is an involuntary reaction that our bodies have and we don't think about it but our eyes are impacted by happiness that whenever we're smiling you can kind of feel the corners of your eyes also kind of close a little bit uh, or squint a little bit 
involuntarily as part of that smile. Um, I had someone in, in a Psych 101 class refer to that as the SMYES, the S-M-E-Y-E-S, -E which I think is a great way to talk about it. So you can tell if somebody is faking uh, how happy they are on social media by looking at their SMYES and whether or not they have them. Uh, all right, so let's change topics a little bit because we are going to be talking about emotion. We're going to be talking about faces and, and what they give away in body language this semester. What about, to change gears, which of these is an actual penny? You can look at these 12 variations, and only one of them is the correct penny. Which one is it? Sorry, I sipped some coffee. You're going to get a lot of that this semester. I love coffee, and I usually record these a little bit later at night. You can even see my dog over there, Fozzie. He is asleep behind me, uh, keeping me company, though. Um, so which of these is the actual penny? Go ahead and make your guess. Put some money on it. It is this over here in the top right. And yet, there's a pretty good chance you didn't get that right. And I'm not just saying that because I'm trying to insult you, but because whenever I teach this class, whenever I teach classes on memory, people are really, really bad at, at identifying this penny as being the authentic penny. But why? Why is that so hard? Aren't we around, I was gonna say, aren't we around pennies all the time, but I guess maybe we're not all that, around them all that much these days, but you've seen coins before. Um, why is it that you can't remember this one specifically? Well, I'm gonna answer that a little bit later this semester, but the, the big picture is that we don't need to know these details. We don't need to know where the word liberty is on the penny. We don't need to know where the, where the year is, or we don't need to know what is up at the top of the penny. Generally, all that we know about pennies is who's on it, Abraham Lincoln, and that it's made of copper. Um, we don't need, if we were trying, if we were on a daily basis trying to make sure that people weren't passing counterfeit pennies on us, then maybe it might be worth knowing where these smaller details are. But for the most, for, for the most part, we don't need to know. And so we don't bother doing that. Um, so we're gonna be talking a lot about memory uh, this semester. Look at these goofy faces. What is going on here? What is going on here? These are pictures that were taken for a study that was done in the 20 aughts, uh, where basically someone um, um, found that whenever a group of people had to hold a pen in their mouth like this, they reported being happier than a group of college students that were balancing uh, a pen on their lip like this. So why was this group happier than this group over here? The reason for that, and I love that this picture is so goofy, uh, the reason for that, as the researchers point out, is that whenever you're doing a face like this, you are simulating a grin. You are forcing your body to make a grin. Here, you're forcing your body to make a sad, pouty face. And if you're doing this for 20 minutes, according to these researchers, essentially what happens is that your body is tricked, quote unquote, into thinking that it's happy or thinking that it's sad based on this. This is called the response feedback loop um, where basically um, uh, uh, because emo emotions are an involuntary thing that if you are forcing your body into that emotion that you will start to uh, 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 maybe perceive slightly uh, that you are feeling that emotion. Uh, so sometimes if you ever see me on campus, I'll be carrying a pencil around in my mouth like that, forcing myself to grin, because back when I first heard this, when I was in Psych 101, I was like, hey, if that's true, maybe I can use that to my advantage. If I'm having a bad day, maybe I can hold a pencil like that, and it'll make me happy. I don't know. That's what research says. Uh, is it true? I don't know. You tell me. Do I seem like a happy person? Um, all right. There's a lot more to unpack out of all of these studies that I'm talking about, but I'm just kind of trying to get you engaged and interested in some of the things, some of the concepts we're going to be talking about this semester. Here are a couple of more. Uh, let's walk through an awareness test here. Uh, oh, you shouldn't see that. That's behind the scenes. One second. Where is... Here we go. Um, all right. This is an awareness test. Oh, sorry, that might be too big. Here we go. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. 
but did you see the moonwalking bear? Alright, so you probably saw it, right? That the moonwalking bear moved across the screen. Now, whenever I talk about this in the classroom, I hope that this video is hard for me to show you a video inside this video. Um, but hopefully, whenever you saw this, um, uh, you maybe didn't see the moonwalking bear on the first try. And when I show this in the classroom, sometimes people will say, wait a second, it wasn't actually in the first half. You can see it here. You can see him right there. Um, but he is also there in the first half. Sometimes people think that, I don't know, some kind of trick um, where he's only in the second half of the video. But no, he's there. So the interesting thing about this is that people will report not seeing this moonwalking bear. Why does that happen? Um, the interesting thing here is that our eyes, everyone who sees this, regardless of if you report seeing it or not, whenever we see that, whenever the moonwalking bear is going across the screen, our cornea, uh, our retina is picking up that information. We are physically seeing it, but we are not actually perceiving it. So there is a difference between sensation and perception that we'll be talking about. Uh, I got another video for you here. This is a really old one, so I apologize for the quality, but I had to show up because this is one that I saw when I was in, uh, not Psych 101, but a learning class that really helped kind of solidify classical conditioning for me. So here we go. And I know it might seem a little bit cruel that this uh, older sister is uh, torturing her younger brother. But hey, if you are an older sister, you just, you know how it goes. Alright, okay, so again, I apologize for the quality, I know it's not the best quality, but, um, <laughs> and maybe it was a little bit mean of, of the sister to do that, but what you saw was a typical example of classical conditioning, that whenever you associate something that is totally neutral, totally unemotional with something that is maybe emotional, like being shot with a toy gun, um, you begin to associate that previously neutral stimulus with that really salient um, uh, emotional um, uh, stimulus so that the regular boring neutral stimulus is now eliciting a totally different reaction than it used to. We're going to talk a lot about classical conditioning uh, this semester, uh, but that's just a, one that always stuck with me whenever I was uh, uh, taking psych classes way back in the day. And then finally, the last video I have for you here is the marshmallow test. You've almost surely seen this or heard of this uh, experiment before, but this is some fun footage. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one. So then you'll have two. 
But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm going to go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Uh, it smells really good. Take your picks for who's going to win. Who's going to actually wait for that second marshmallow. Bold strategy, I love it. A little bit of a cheater here. He's struggling. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm gonna leave and then I'll come back, okay? So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> All right, how nice, right? So yes, that even qualifies as psychology. What that study shows, uh, basically there was a, what they call a longitudinal study, where they check in at a later time to see how results compare across the time span. And what they found is that whenever people are kids, if they are really good at delaying gratification like that, if they're really good at waiting for that larger reward, then that means that usually it predicts how well they will be, how, how successful they will be uh, whenever they are adults. So, um, you know, how much money they will make, you know, uh, whether or not they own a home, etc. cetera. Um, so uh, what does that mean about delay gratification? What does that mean about development? You know, what does that mean about changing quote unquote willpower and things like that? Lots to discuss there which we'll talk about later this semester. Last last video that I have for you here, because um, I, I forgot I embedded this one. It's a quick one, uh, it's a fun one. Do your best, I would say, um, if you're watching this on your phone, try to make, sh try to get this, you know, big on your visual field. Or if you're watching this on a screen, lean forward so that it's taking up a lot of your visual field. It it'll work best like that, and if you're not moving. <laughs> I'll do it too. I'll lean forward so we're not the only ones looking weird. Hi, I know the video looks odd, but don't worry about that. If you can, turn up the brightness on your screen, because I'm going to try and get you to experience an amazing optical illusion. What I'd like you to do is simply stare at the dark dot that I've just placed on the end of my nose. Try and keep your head and your eyes perfectly stationary and stare at the dot. Now don't worry, there's not going to be any sudden images come up on the screen or any scary sounds. Simply stare at the dot. In a moment, this video is going to turn black and white. And I hope that just for a few seconds, you're going to see it in full colour. For the first time in your life, you're going to see a black and white video in full colour. 
keep staring at the dot. And the video will turn black and white when I say the word now. Are you ready? Three, two, one, now. Hopefully, for a few moments there, you saw a black and white video in full color. I hope you enjoyed the illusion. All right, so again, I don't know your viewing context. That definitely worked for me. If it didn't work for you, you can find this in the lecture slides and you can try it yourself. Um, it's totally fun. I love doing, I love experiencing this one. Uh, and sometimes, again, people are skeptical. They think that I'm playing some kind of trick on them. But if you go from when there is color to when there is not color like that, you can see that this, this is a still frame. It's totally grayscale. Uh, so why is it that your brain is telling you that this black and white image actually has color in it? It's one of the things that we will look at this semester. All right, so what are we covering in this class? Or are you just going to hang out with me each week and watch videos like that? Uh, not exactly. Um, instead, it, it'll be a little bit more formal. Uh, but here are some of the things that we're going to be covering this semester. We're going to be talking about the biological basis of behavior. So we're going to be talking about how parts of our body communicates with each other. So like uh, how your brain communicates with your big toe. So you can wiggle your big toe. Or how um, your pinky can uh, relay information to your brain to let you know uh, that you've gotten stung by a bee or bitten by an ant or something like that. So we'll talk about neurons and the building blocks of communication throughout the body. We'll talk about memory. So we'll talk about why we forget some things and why we don't forget other things. What is it about an event or information that can make it sticky for your memory? We're going to be talking about social behavior. We have a whole chapter on social psychology. So we'll be talking about whether or not people make a difference on our behavior. Do you behave the same way no matter who is around you? Do you behave the same way when your parents are around versus your friend group versus your professors versus your boss at work? Um, uh, in that chapter, we'll also talk about how we kind of perceive ourselves there. Uh, we'll be talking about psychological disorders, which is I know what a lot of people really they take psych 101, psych 101 wanting to know more about psychological disorders but it's honestly such a small part of the field um so much of your psych major if you do go into psychology um this is just a small piece of the pie there's so much uh, else left to talk about in terms of the human experience and, and how how we experience the world um but we will be talking about psychological disorders as you probably would have predicted but we're only really going to be talking about it uh for one chapter dedicated for one chapter i'm just trying to get your expectations uh for the course um in in line uh so we'll be talking about for example what schizophrenia is what are the symptoms of schizophrenia how does it start we'll be talking about how we treat things like depression or anxiety or or trauma um, we'll be talking about consciousness, so we'll be talking about what happens when we are sleeping, what are dreams made of, um, are they significant in any way, um, and we'll talk about stress, health, and the interaction between these things, which is, uh, for me, I almost always get sick at the end of a semester, and I don't know if you are the same way too. It doesn't matter for me if I'm a student or if I'm an instructor, I always get sick at the end of the semester. We'll talk about why that is uh, later this semester. Um, so this is a good point to take a break if you are like me and for me I am I'm pretty good at watching movies but if I'm watching TV or something like that I usually need a little bit of a break in between uh, key ideas um, that's just the way that human attention works and those of you that use TikTok a lot know this especially well I've heard people talk about TikTok brain where you can't really pay attention to things for more than like two or three minutes where you get a little bit restless um, so I'm going to record these videos for each chapter as long videos uh, to give you the flexibility if you want to pause and come back or if you want to take breaks or if you want to just kind of binge it all in one place. But I will try to let you know when some good points to break are. That was one of them. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the nitty gritty specifics uh, about the course structure now that we have some idea about what we're going to be talking about in Psych, in, in psych 101. So our textbook is uh, just called Psychology and is offered by a bunch of different authors. It is required, but it is free. You do not need to pay for it at all. Um, you can click on this link, which you can also find in our syllabus. It'll take you to this landing page. This is a uh, totally free um, 
uh, uh, textbook, and I forgot to mention that the lead author here is Rose Spielman, and she is from Quinnipiac University, which is right down the road from me because uh, I live in Connecticut. Uh, so um, the best way to, to, to engage with this book, if you are somebody that's on the go a lot, I don't know, maybe downloading a PDF might be helpful. If you want to print out some pages, that can be a way to do it too. You can also order personal copies if you like to have the, the physical uh, thing in hand. Uh, but I like to just hit view online. Um, it's going to ask you for a donation or whatever. So maybe if you want to, you can bookmark this chapter so it doesn't ask you <laughs> for, for money because you're a broke college student just like uh, everyone else is. And that's why it's free is because I don't want you to have to pay for uh, books because I was a broke college student and I know what that life is like. Um, all right, so uh, this is the textbook. Um, basically, it has you know digital pages that are kind of grouped by course ideas. You can navigate it pretty simply. Got all these history things. We talk about the Maslow and his hierarchy of needs, but you can kind of see all the all the different chapters uh, here on the side. This is digital, so make good use of that. You're going to see that, you know, um, for example, if you know you, you have a, a quiz or something like that and you're asked a question about, let's say, uh, Pavlov. You can type in Pavlov and it's going to give you all these different examples where Pavlov comes up. So maybe it's a chapter six thing. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can highlight it if you want to. Uh, you'd have to create an account to do that. There are guides. I have not tried any of those guides, so I can't speak to them. Uh, it says that it's free, so check it out if you want to. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping that because this is like a free, easy to access uh, textbook that maybe that'll encourage you to check it out and to, to stay engaged with the readings. Um, so the catch here is that, as you may have seen, the images aren't super good, and I think really that's honestly the biggest drawback to this textbook is that the images aren't really super fancy, They're, the graphics aren't cutting edge, amazing um, for the figures and for the data. So um, I think that this book is great for a Psych 101 course like this, but I, I don't know, it's not perfect, but I think that at least in my experience of using textbooks, because the ones that I used before this one, it usually runs for about 150 bucks. Um, I don't know. I'm willing to take some kind of grainy, not great uh, images to save 150 bucks. <laughs> um, all right. Whoops, I did not mean to click that again. All right. So let's talk a little bit about what this course is like. I will be upfront with you that this course is a lot of work. There are gonna be a lot of assignments. You have something to do every single week, uh, except for maybe this first week. Um, but uh, you're going to have multiple grading opportunities. So uh, if you're like me and you're somebody that doesn't really do well on the first couple of assignments, never fear. Um, the quizzes that you're gonna be doing this semester, there's gonna be one each week and so by, by comparison, one single quiz is not going to sink your grade. Um, but if you stay consistent and you stay on top of your work, your grade will probably be pretty good because here we're looking at lots of assignments, which means that staying engaged, staying focused, staying involved and active is going to bring your grade up. Um, and you don't have to worry about one or two questions really devastating your grade because there's so much uh, um, uh, quizzes that you're going to see. Um, all right. The reason why I do that, though, is not because I want there to be busy work. I try to make sure that each and every one of my assignments that I'm going to give you this semester uh, has a purpose and is specifically targeted to assess one of the learning outcomes for this uh, for this class. So I don't do this to punish you by giving you a lot of work. I do it to kind of get you thinking about the material in a lot of different ways uh, and so that it will stick with you so that whenever you graduate from this class, uh, maybe you'll remember some of the big key concepts there. So I don't intend it as punishment. Uh, whenever I ask you questions, I'm usually not looking for uh, tricky or nitpicky type of things. I don't really care all that much if you know what the B in B.F. Skinner stands for. I don't really care if you know when B.F. Skinner was born. Um, those are not things that you're ever really going to have to contend with in the real world, so I'm not going to ask you about them. Um, so 
yeah, there is going to be a lot of work, but I'm going to try to make it fair. I'm going to try to make it interesting. Um, and I'm going to try to make it predictable. I'm going to try to make it very to be very routine, so that way you know exactly what's due every single week. And our due date for everything is going to be Sunday by the end of the day. So if it's Sunday and you realize you haven't done, you haven't submitted anything for the week, then you will know there's something you should have done. It's probably a quiz and a discussion. Hopefully not an exam, but maybe... Maybe you forgot there was one. But yeah, every Sunday there'll be something due. The way that I see our class is not, I don't see our me and you as being antagonistic towards one another. I see us as working on the same team. I see myself as on your side because I want you to do good in this class. I want you to succeed in this class. I want everybody to su succeed in this class. And so I think for that reason, I kind of see my role a little bit like a coach where it's my job to kind of give you whatever tips and strategies out of my playbook um, so that way you can go and succeed against Psych 101, that you can beat those concepts, you can master that material, um, that you can do well on, on the quizzes and exams. Uh, so, um, But because I'm the coach, I can't go out and play as part of the team. I can't go run the ball or whatever, but I can give you all of my tips and strategies uh, that I can to get you there. Um, all right. Uh, here is some really boring office hour stuff. So this is all in the syllabus just in case you need it. But I am reached best through email. Uh, I know that sometimes peop some professors like to be messaged on Play-Doh um, or Blackboard. I don't really like that. And the reason why is because, at least for professors, there's I don't think there's a way that I can get that as an alert on my phone uh, that I got an email, uh, that I got a message from you. But I do get alerts on my phone if you send me an email. So if you send me an email, that will work. Um, just give me 24 hours to turn that email around. Um, it is, I'm gonna be real with you for a second. There's a generation gap between uh, between a lot of students and professors, um, just generally speaking, but uh, as I'm a millennial, and I know a lot of y'all are gonna be Gen Z or, or even maybe even younger than that, um, but one thing that's kind of increasingly common it's like you send a professor an email. They don't get back to you in three hours. So you send the exact same email or you forward the email that you saw. But here's the thing. This is my job and I love my job and I care about y'all. But if it's 10 p.m., I'm probably not going to answer my email. And the reason why is because I want to go to bed <laughs> or because I want to relax. I don't want to always be uh, working. Um and that's just kind of where I find my, my work-life balance. Hopefully, you will find a work-life balance that works for you this semester. But with that being said, is that if it's 24 hours and I don't email you back, definitely, by all means, email me for a follow-up just to make sure I didn't lose your email in my inbox. Uh, I'm not trying to be sassy. Uh, but, um, yeah, I do care about you, and I will get you an email back. But just give me 24 hours to do that. Um, all right. Uh, for office hours, I would love for someone to pop by during office hours if you can. Uh, if you're going to be on campus during these times, you want to pop in and say hello. I would love that so much because this is an online class. I'm not going to see you otherwise. And so for that reason, I it's such a thrill for me to be able to kind of um, match your face and your presence along with your name because I usually get to know your work and your responses pretty well by the end of the semester but have no idea uh, what your voice sounds like or what you look like. Um, and it's a very one-sided relationship because you're going to see a lot of what I look like and hear a lot of what I sound like. Um, but if these times don't work well for you and you want to study up for an exam or you want to ask me some questions or whatever, or you just want to come by and say hello, uh, you can always email me and we can set up a time that either works on Zoom, works over the phone, or works in person. I know these times are not convenient for everybody, so maybe we can find some middle ground there. Let's talk a little bit about the different assignments that we have. Here is the pie chart where you can kind of see what all we have here. We got exams. They are going to each count for 10% of your grade. Um, we have online quizzes, which out of the 14, 13 of those, that's going to count for 30% of your grade. We got online discussions, which are 15%, and then a final project uh, that is also 15% as well. 
Uh, so what are each of those things? What are each of those categories? Uh, the exams, those are equally weighted. So even the final exam, the final exam is going to count just as much as all the others. The final exam is going to be cumulative, so it is going to cover everything. Uh, but hey, it's okay because it is only counting as much as the others, uh, which is only 10%, which is not that much. If you don't do it and you get a zero, that costs you a letter grade. But in other words, you can skip an exam and still make an A minus in the class. I would not recommend that. That's going to make your job harder to keep that A minus, but it is possible. Um, these exams are going to cover pretty much everything. So if it's covered in the textbook, if it's covered in the lecture videos that I make for this class or in the online discussions, then it is fair game for the exam. I'll give you a heads up and give you like a study guide or something like that. So that way you kind of have an idea of what's going to be covered. Uh, quizzes, these are going to be due every Sunday at the end of the week. Um, so they are going to be posted all on Plato, all on Blackboard. And my hope is that you're going to read, uh, 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 read this stuff before you take the quizzes. So that way you can focus on the really advanced concepts. You can identify areas that are maybe some, some problem areas for you. And that way you can uh, ask me questions about um, uh, about that before you take it on, on the quiz. Uh, or if you um, uh, know that there is something that's really tricky, you can always email me um, before you take the quiz and we can talk about it. In, in, you, that way you can feel good about it <laughs> and you can uh, make a 100 on the quiz. Uh, quizzes are meant to be not super challenging, by the way. Uh, they're just meant to kind of keep you engaged with the work and up to date. Um, there are 12 multiple choice questions. They come straight from the textbook. Uh, you get a whole hour to do that. So if you need to, you can just open up the quiz and the text at the same time and be okay. Uh, you can skim through it. Uh, but my hope is that you'll read it before taking the quiz. Uh, all right, the discussions that we have, a lot of them are going to be kind of like some basic cognitive tests or uh, some kind of social psychology little experiment that you can do at home or whatever. They're meant to be kind of these fun things to try out. Um, uh, yeah, and they're going to be these open-ended questions you can also find on Plato. Uh, they're going to be due Sunday also at the end of the day. And I'll give you full credit for providing a thoughtful post and a response to a classmate. So you need a post, you need a response, and it needs to be thoughtful. You know what I mean by that. I'm looking for you to draw connections between course material and course concepts, uh, to think about how things are related through, into the real world. If you just give me a sentence or two and you're not really going the extra mile, then you probably won't make a 100 on those, and that's okay. But you might make a 90. Um, and uh, if you usually make less than that, I'll try to give you an explanation for why. You can find uh, a full rubric for that on Plato. I'll show you where to find that in a moment. Uh, and then there's the final creator project, which is worth 15% of your grade as well. And this is going to be due at the end of the year, where I want you to create a surviving the first year of college mental health guide. Uh, and so that will entail you highlighting five potential mental health obstacles that a student might encounter in their first year of college and then f explain five ways that students might either avoid those obstacles or find ways to treat them. So the example, and there's lots of fun ideas, creative ideas that you can think of maybe um, off the top of your head right now, um, but the one that I'll kind of use as an example, because uh, I don't want to give too many away, is uh, stress, right? So stress management is uh, is obviously a huge obstacle uh, in your first week, uh, first year of college. Uh, so how might you identify what a you know what a stressor is? How might you avoid it in a healthy way? Or if it is a stressor that you do need to engage with, like classwork, classwork is stressful. Um, what is a way to to remedy that, to treat that? Maybe it's that you uh, set up times specifically to do your work. Maybe it is that you reward yourself with an ice cream or something whenever you have finished something stressful. I don't know. Um, you can think of ways that are individual to you that might be helpful to you. Um, 
And I want you to be creative here. So you can submit this as a paper. You can submit it as like a cool pamphlet with like images on it. Or you can make a video uh, explaining a countdown of five, you know, the five biggest mental health obstacles uh, for first year students, whatever. I want you to be creative. I want you to do something that is not just fun for you, but is rewarding for you. Something that you feel like, okay, now I'm understanding this a little bit better. Um, Cause I know some of you are first year students. I call it, not everybody is, but some of you are. Um, that full rubric you can find on Plato later. Other details, if you require any kind of accommodations through the Binaco Center, just let me know. I'm happy to uh, work with you on those. Uh, there is a makeup policy, which is minus 10% each day that something is late. I think honestly that's pretty generous because a lot of the stuff you're gonna have more than a week in advance. Uh, so you can do it anytime throughout the week, um, even a week ahead of times. Um, so if there is an emergency, just email me, let me know, and I'd be happy to kind of work with you on those things. This is an online class. There's zero tolerance for plagiarism. I think y'all know exactly what I mean by that. So if you cite something from an outside source, and actually here is something that I feel like maybe professors don't stress to their students, is that um, if you find information from an outside source, and again, this is an online class, probably you're going to Google something, right? It's okay to Google it as long as you explain that you Googled it. Because for me, as a researcher, as someone who publishes about the research that I do, people know that I read other research papers and that I use ideas from that. But because every scientist does and is, and is expected to. But we have to cite our sources. We have to say, here's where I got this information. Here's where, here's how I know, you know, what the limitations of short-term memory are. It's because it's cited in, it's because it was originally researched in this paper. Um, so it's good practice to cite where you get info. So if you are using information that you got from the textbook on a short answer question on an exam, say where you got that info that's all you have to do and that communicates to me that you're not trying to plagiarize you're not trying to pass off someone else's work or an AI's work as your own uh, you can say hey I used chat GPT to do this or hey I found this on Wikipedia or hey I found this in the textbook if you have questions or if you're worried about that let me know and again this is one of those things where it's like if you're reaching out ahead of time, then I can generally assume that you're not trying to do anything devious. You're not trying to be dishonest in your work. And don't forget office hours. I'm super happy to meet with you um, with any kind of questions you have. If you do have any questions, you can email me right now <laughs> if you want to. Um, but before I let you go, I have a couple of things I want to run through. The first is the first discussion that uh, that we're going to have for this semester is part of the chapter one section, which is not due this week. It's actually due next week. We're, this first week, we're kind of spending time on Plato, getting used to things. But I wanted to give you a little bit of a head start in case you wanted to work on next week, which is chapter one. So this is the discussion that you can do. Uh, just give me your name. And what I'm looking for here is not the name that it says, you know, um, on Plato or on Blackboard, but give me the name that you prefer to be known as, that you like to go by. Um, if you're, if you're, if you go by your your middle name instead of your first name, then then just say that. And we'll be happy, you know. If we can, we'll do our best to remember that and to you know to honor that. Um, let me know what year you are at Westfield. Uh, tell me something that you're interested in learning about in the class, and what is something that you think is unique about yourself. I know these icebreakers suck. They're not that fun, uh, and every class does them, but they really do genuinely help me remember who you are so that whenever I see your stuff later in other discussion posts later in the semester, I can be like, oh, yeah, that's Margaret. Margaret loves, um, I don't know, she loves Kendrick Lamar, and so whenever I see Margaret's work, I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember Margaret. She loves... Um, uh, untitled Unmastered for some reason. I don't know why somebody would like that album. Uh, sorry, don't tell Kendrick Lamar I said that. Um, all right, now before you go, if you want to, you can you can check out now. I wanted to just show you very quickly how to run through Plato. 
in, in case it's your, your first time uh, playing around with it. But this is the first page that you will see on Play-Doh. Uh, you'll see my announcements. So the first announcement you'll see in this semester will populate here. Uh, here in the communications tab, this just shows all my uh, ways that you can get in touch with me, including the office hours. Uh, the course calendar, um, here I have this divided by week. Uh, so there's not any specific time you need to be online. We don't need to meet over Zoom or anything like that, you know, weekly or whatever. Uh, but you can see here that the first week there's nothing due this Sunday. Uh, we're just kind of going over the syllabus and, and introducing our getting used to the class. Next week, uh, that's when we start Chapter 1, and then we have the Chapter 1 assignments. So let's take a look at Chapter 1's assignments. Chapter 1 is not done yet. I still need to record a video for you. But otherwise, all of the chapters are going to look like this, where you're going to have the quiz, you're going to have the discussion, and then you're going to have the slides. So the slides that you can download um, and that you can check out uh, along with the recording of, of me going over those videos there. Basically, I'm aiming to kind of keep this class very much like the same experience that you would get if you had this in an in-person class. Um, because I know that sometimes if you take classes online, if you're just doing readings, it can be really, really, really easy to forget that stuff after the semester is over. And I want to make sure that this is a memorable experience that you that you're actually getting your money's worth, that you feel like you learned something, and that you can have something you can take away from this class and apply it to the real world. Course info and syllabus. This here is going to talk about. Um, you got your syllabus here. You got the discussion rubrics here. You got the Psych 101 textbook here. It's also here in the sidebar too, but if you want to access it here. And then here we have the psychology pre-assessment. Uh, I should have done a better job of explaining this at the very top of things, but I'll send an email out to remind everybody about it, the, about this. The psychology pre-assessment is something that is required for all Psych 101 students in order to receive a grade for this class. You have to take this survey. You can make a 100 on everything this semester, and if you don't take this survey, you just don't get a you don't get a grade. It's something that is required to move on from this class. I know that sounds weird, but that's just the way it is. Um, so this survey is not for a grade. You don't get graded on your performance here, um, but it's going to ask you a bunch of questions about psychology. Just do your best. Uh, and the reason why we have people do this is because we have our majors at the very end of their careers here. In their final class, we give them this survey again to kind of see the growth that happens from Psych 101 students to our senior level students. So take that. It takes less than 30 minutes. It'll take you maybe less than 20 minutes to do it. Uh, but you can find that there. Um, I already went over chapter one. The exams, this will uh, show up in the exams folder as you might expect. You can find the first exam here. Don't take it just yet. Uh, this is a shell uh, that is not quite done, um, but it will be done by the end of the week. Uh, so that'll be after you can check your course calendar. That'll be due basically February 19th. So you got Oh, you got a month to worry about it, and it's going to be the first four chapters. Uh, and then we have the final research project. You can find uh, where to, to, to submit uh, that creative project there. So you can submit that before the end of the semester. And that is it. The last thing that I want to do, for those of you that wait to the very end of the lecture videos, I always try to have a little surprise at the very end. Maybe it's a video, maybe it's a funny picture that I found, maybe I, I talk to one of my dogs and I bring him up on the camera, or something. Uh, for this one, I'm gonna show you a video that uh, I think is kind of funny that talks or references the marshmallow video that we watched, and I thought it was super cute, um, but not necessarily important to Psych 101. It's super cute, so I wanted to have that as like a little bit of a treat. If you want to stay on, if you don't, you can close out this video now. You're not going to miss anything on the exam. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you for the Chapter 1 video later. Bye. Heard marshmallow experiment tests children's self-control. You have a choice. You can eat it now, totally cool, or if you can wait till I get back, I'll give you a second marshmallow. I can, I can do it. You can wait 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. OK. Oh, by the way, if you want, you can use that cup to cover it up so you don't have to look at it. Good luck. OK. Researchers showed that by putting a marshmallow in front of a kid and daring him not to eat it, you could tell if one day they'd be the next Steve Jobs 
or the next Steve Gutenberg. Now, in the original experiment, they just waited to see what happened, but I don't have the patience for that. All right. Oh, you ate it. That's okay. I didn't eat it. I missed a cup and it was gone. How'd you do? Good. <laughs> was it good? Yeah. After I let slip the cup, it just disappeared. What disappeared? The marshmallow. Would you like another one? Oh, buddy, here. You want to eat this one? It's okay. Here, eat this one. You can eat this one. It disappeared like magic? Yeah. Well, eat this one. Tell me how it tastes. Good. Is it good? Well, we made a kid cry, so I'd say phase one was a success. All right, what a fun kid, right? My heart goes out for this kid. What a, what a doll. All right, see you later. Bye-bye, everybody.